So I'm back on again now and I have just only just realized my wife came in and said that it sounds like it has been muted the entire time. So thanks for the heads up. Now, if you can hear us, give us a thumbs up. Um, I should have probably done that at the start uh, to make sure you guys could hear me. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just recap with what I said because you guys would have had no idea what I was actually saying before and I've got some really good content on here that I want to chat about um, in regards to the unexpected side costs on building either a new or a renovated home and building renovation. Now, um, I'm just going to run through the start again. So, um, intro, I'm Toby Drew. You probably know that, but if you're tuning in for the first time, that is my name. My name, my building company is Toby Drew Homes. My name's on the front of the front of the truck. I pride myself in the quality and workmanship of my my trades and myself, and and my my. I just want to obviously serve my customers the best way I can. Now, where I conduct my work is basically in the Moreton Bay regional area. I am usually doing a few suburbs in and around it, towards the sunny coast, out west a little bit, and then also down towards sort of Boondle Way that way. Uh, I don't work in the city. Uh, I usually work in the northern suburbs. Um, now, the reason why I came on here is um, every fortnight, I want to jump on a Wednesday night at about seven and I want to give some tips and tricks and some info about the building industry that you may or may not know and something to look out for when you are thinking of purchasing a property or thinking about building a new home or possibly doing a renovation on your property. Um, now how I can help you, obviously I'm going to give you some tips and tricks on maybe doing certain things in the initial stages. Um, which may help you alleviate some of these costs or unknowns. Um, I, I guess getting rid of those assumptions and, and then having the facts and knowing exactly what you get yourself into. All right. So um, I did ask last week for some questions and I, and I had a whole heap come in and uh, I even had some come through my private, um, private messages, which I was able to answer for them. Um, but for the ones that, for the ones that did come through, um, Thank you, and, and I want you guys to keep throwing us um, plenty of questions. So if you have any, uh, if you're watching, um, throw a question in, ask us, ask away, and I'll, I'll be able to probably do it on the next one. Um, but the, the one question that I had a few times in the private and on it, uh, there was a question from uh, Sarah. So it was uh, the biggest unexpected site costs. Now, site costs, yeah. I understand the question because it's one that comes up when you're buying in these new estates and it's in the clause there where it can just be thrown in, in an unexpected way. But what I thought I'd do is actually go into more detail in regards to unexpected costs that come up during the build. So thinking about the ones that come, say, before the build starts, before design, things that potentially come up during the build and, and once it's completed. Now, I've broken it down into these sort of stages, but these stages can happen at any stage. So these things can happen at any stage. So this is just a bit of a rough thing that I've seen, a bit of a guideline. So beforehand, one of the unexpected costs, obviously, is site costs. So to take those assumptions of what it could and could not be, um, we do, for example, a soil test. Now, that covers um, things in regards to the engineering requirements for the slab. Um, a big one is obviously highly reactive slabs um, can obviously increase um, costs in the reinforcement that the slab actually requires. Um, if you're on fill or, or bad soil or you've got a lot of trees around, um, you may be required um, to put in piers. Um, that can be a, a fairly large site cost there. Um, and but then it doesn't just stop there. So if you're not in one of those brand new estates and you're building on say an existing property or you've knocked something down and you're building new or you've had it, you're building on like a, a smaller development where it might have been just say several blocks. Now they may not have been prepared in the same way as the new estates do. So the new estates really do pride themselves on making sure that they have the necessary retaining walls to keep the blocks flat. 
They have the compaction reports for when they're doing any cut and fill. Um, they're, they're looking at like the flood levels and, and, um, and possibly even the acoustic overlays of the, the area um, and putting in barriers and different things to try and create an estate that limits the amount of extra costs onto the owner. This allows them to sell the properties in a way where when it goes into a contract and they've then got a builder coming and finance is getting involved, if they start having blocks and trying to sell blocks with all these unexpected costs, all of a sudden they'll, their land will, and the bank approvals will get knocked back and that can then lead to obviously the loss of the sale and all that waste of time that they haven't been able to sell the property. So by getting rid of that and they are able to do it for the entire estate, which actually works out to be a little bit cheaper in the long run, and they just add those costs onto the build, onto the onto the land, sorry. Um, so a few of the other ones, um, so if you're living close to the ocean or on a hill or something, you might have wind loadings. Um, and in, in the initial stages, that can be something that you've got the design of the house and you know a soil report will be asked um, and then all of a sudden you'll have a lot of terms and conditions in regards to things that the builder potentially will be assuming. So assuming that um, the, the soil is of a certain type or the wind loads of a certain type or um, all these different factors. Um, so if you were to go and have you know each of those things worked out, then, then you can then obviously before the contract's signed, you know what you get yourself into. So just a few of the other things. So energy efficiency, depending on the colours of your home. If you've got dark roofs and dark coloured walls, um, if you're on an open open sort of um, acreage property, uh, you may have like tinted glass, um, upgraded insulation, all those sort of factors that come into play. Um, here at Toby Drew Homes, we, we do pride ourselves in all that insulation type stuff. Um, we see the benefit and the value in it. Um, we obviously have a min minimum standard on a new build of uh, an energy efficiency rating of five star. But um, just with some of the products that we use, uh, we go over and above um, to, to make sure that the house is as, as comfortable as it can be. Uh, so you're, you're having to avoid turning on the air con and, and using the power in that way. Um, acoustic overlays, I might have mentioned it. Uh, if you're if you're near ra near railway lines and and um, major major um, road networks that sort of stuff, um, surveying costs. Now, if you buy a block of land, for example, make sure your pegs are put in. If your pegs aren't there, just you you got to ask for them because that is a cost that the developer would have had it all pegged, and it'll be a lot cheaper for them to add those pegs back in. Um, having having yourself come in and have to do that again, it does cost money. When you are looking at doing like a new home or an extension close to the boundary on a, an existing property, you may end up having to peg out the outside boundary pegs of your existing property. And if they've been moved, um, they're going to be no good. Um, you got fire overlay. So that was another question that came in. You know, what are the expected costs around that type of thing now? With overlays, these days, when you purchase a property, you can apply to council for the overlays for that property. And that would be something that I've done in the past myself and I would suggest to people to do is check your overlays. So when you're checking your overlays, you can check for, for land overflow, flood, um, fire. If you're in sort of um, an area where there might be like... Um, low level water, you, you got like acidic levels and things like that, which can all add costs to the build itself. Um, and fire overlays are something to think about because it does change a fair bit. Um, you've got to go to um, special fly screens, um, metal fly screens and, and the gaps and different things around the outside of the property have to be um, limited uh, so that ambers and things can't sort of sit there and burn. But um, the certifier will normally pick that up in the initial stages before going to contract and um, and then that will then be priced accordingly. But if you were to know that you were in a fire overlay or an acoustic overlay, you'd be knowing that there's something coming up, whether it be windows or something, that there's going to be an extra cost. And before you start the job, you can be asking for those costs uh, before the contract is signed and before you commence with it. Um, Asbestos, that happens more so with uh, renovations. Now, when you're doing a renovation, I always have it tested, the whole house tested. It's easy to test initially 
than to try and do it during the job. If it's done during the job, you get delays and then you got the unexpected cost and the contamination that could be created when revealing that was asbestos as well. Um, so we don't we, we we sort of treat that very very seriously the asbestos and I like to get that sort of right at the start clear out plenty of it and get it away from where we're working so we don't have to touch it and then we then just work and marry it all back into the extension. Now with asbestos back in the day people went and buried it so when you got like old houses that can be an unexpected cost things that are buried so things like treatment plants or a pool or asbestos and um, and that's happened before and you come across it and there's nothing you can really do other than deal with it and the cost involved so you know you should always have that little bit of a buffer from doing renovations for that reason um, covenant requirements in a new estate they have a covenant keeps the quality of the homes higher in the area and allows for better resale and obviously when they're selling the rest of the blocks it keeps the area looking nice um, they can add costs before, during, and after. Um, you know, beforehand it could be to do with the design. During it could be, you know, the developer being very, very strict on, you know, sediment control, um, the cleanliness of the, the site, um, the, uh, how, how things look uh, neat, everything's neat, and how the trades may park in the street and things like that. Now, those costs and those issues usually come back on the builder. Um, but in saying that, you know, it's just it's just that added thing. Afterwards, it can also come in the form of um, you know not being allowed to park certain vehicles or, or caravans and things on the front of your property, and you may be up for costs in trying to get that sort of stuff behind your fence line or having to store it elsewhere, at least until the rest of the land in the area is sold, and then and then they're uh, usually off and, and doing their own thing again. Um, the tree report that can sometimes be done during a soil report. Um, if you've got major trees in the area, um, they may want to uh, identify those trees and put root barriers in, um, and that can be a cost uh, incorporated into the contract of the job. Um, slopes of the blocks, I'm not sure if we covered that, but a lot of estates are trying to do um, terraced type situations so they can sell the land easier, but we do sometimes get a slope block in an existing area or something that is completely like a two-tiered type block, and and we obviously go about engineering and sorting that out. Um, a lot of design work initially goes into that to avoid those assumptions and and and, and obviously create a fixed contract during that build. Um, now during the job, you may have rain delays. There's a certain amount of rain delays allowed um, in a job, um, but depending on the extent of that rain, um, obviously. Um, one job we did do, it rained for about six weeks and it just was relentless. We ended up building in the rain uh, to get the job done, but in saying that, it created a lot of issues with other trades and I'm just not sure whether that sort of thing would continue these days, um, especially with um, the requirements of the workforce and that it would be probably a day, like a health and safety issue. So um, works can be stopped and, and your outgoing costs for, say, renting or or having short-term accommodation uh, could then increase. So that's the unexpected delay and the unexpected cost. Um, site access. So on certain properties, you've got access entering the property. Now that can be deteriorated through, um, you know, a weather event or something, and you may be up for the cost of fixing that access to the property. Um, if you can't gain access to the street and 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 all these other factors. Delays can then happen based on that. Um, some of these estates are opening up streets at a time and they all go into construction at one time, which creates massive delays. And it's unexpected and you try and work through them, but those unexpected delays can be where you've got a concrete truck or say a brick truck has rocked up and it's a B-double of some sort and it parks at the start of the street and it's delivering bricks to a house at the end. And it just blocks down the whole street for, for most of the day, delivering to different houses from maybe a particular builder. And those sort of delays then go on to, you know, potentially be passed on because they're just unexpected delays that there was nothing as a builder yourself could prevent. It was someone else. Um, so during the job, 
you know, that is when you should be getting variations. Now, variations shouldn't be unexpected. Um, they should be like other than the ones that are actually happening from things that were un unknown, like things under the ground and, and different things. But with variations, they should be signed and, and both parties should be in agreement before pre uh, starting with it. So you should just get a random unexpected bill at least. You may have an unexpected variation, but it may not be an unexpected bill. And when a bill is then done, someone's paid for the work and then that means someone needs to be either paid or someone's losing out. Um, now, after, after the job, moving in, now, if you were to be on a bit of a slope block, you may have landscaping, so uh, retaining walls and fencing. Um, covenant requirements might expect you to have a certain amount of lawn or, 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 or grass or turf or whatever um, done. Um, they may allow seed, but they may want turf. Um, certain gardens and, and a certain look of the front of the home completed at the end within a certain time frame. And, um, and if you've only got a build contract for the house and maybe just the driveway, you might be up for these extra costs of getting all that done in a short amount of time. So that needs to be incorporated into your budget. Um, the electrical connection um, can be a cost, um, especially if you're on a main road or something, uh, where NGX needs to shut down the road to get access, especially for lines that are crossing the road and things. Um, and that can sometimes be on that. Um, obviously, when you've moved in, you've got to pay and do that final connection to the home. Um, Keeping up with your warranties and inspections, yearly inspections, that can be an unexpected cost in the form that, you know, you do need to wash your house every six month, months to, you know, to achieve certain warranties on, say, paintwork and roofing and, 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 and you've got your yearly inspections for termites and, and, and you've got other inspections during, during the, the years or afterwards that you should have done and maintenance done to the house. Um, I mean, a lot of people have their cars serviced, but when it comes to a home, it's then just put on the back burner. We'll do it later. We'll do it later. But if you don't, say, for example, clean the glass in your on your windows or in your shower and things like that on a weekly basis, say in the shower and, a, and every few months or six months on the house, you'll get uh, etching and things happening to the glass and, and it could go foggy and things, and depending on the pollution and that in the area. Same with your paintwork. So it's something to consider that if you're not personally going to get out there and scrub your house or, or do this maintenance yourself, uh, you do need to probably pay people to come in and do those sort of things for you or, or you're going to lose parts of your warranty or, or things like that. So it's good to check all your warranty information on each of your products that you've got. Um, now, coming back to your variations at the end you've moved in and all of a sudden you get a variation that you weren't expecting in the bill that comes in now that is a very old way or an old school way of doing things and builders don't do that or aren't allowed legally to do that anymore and like i said before you should have a variation signed by both parties and on my own variations that i do now um I have a running total where if there's a credit, it goes down. If it's uh, an extra, it goes up and everyone's on the same page. They're numbered and, and you know where you stand. We also use um, a program, a software program that allows um, an interaction between the owner, myself and my subcontractors and a messaging uh, so we can message within uh, the platform. Um, we have all of our documents loaded to it and photos. So... On a, on a daily basis, the owner can get in, they can look at what's been done. They can look at the schedule, see what's actually been done on the house, and they can possibly ask questions and different things to different trades or myself, and I can ask the trades for them. Um, and so it keeps the communication going between everyone, and I think that's very important these days, and, and some people lack that um, uh, is, is the communication skills. And if everyone can communicate and everyone be on the same page, then then the bill will go more smoothly, less stress for the owners, less stress for the builders and contractors, resulting in better quality work, better better environment, and, and, and I guess better vibes for the home itself. Um, now, with, with all these unexpected costs, removing the assumptions, that, that's key. So soil tests and... And, you know, having all your different reports done um, is vital. It's vital to do that. 
or paying or paying you know professionals to do the different things to do your investigations. It might sound like a lot to have an engineer or a soil test to be done, say four five hundred dollars for a soil test, but in the end it will save you a lot of heartache uh, for when you have signed the contract and all of a sudden these variations are coming out uh, where it's changed from an M class site to a H1 site with peers and you've all, all of a sudden got a variation of uh, 10 grand coming in or something like that. Um, at least if you know at the start, especially if you've had your own plan say drawn and you've had all this information done yourself and you've gathered all this information together for your builder, um, it sort of allows you to compare apples with apples with everyone. Um, another thing I do suggest if you are going down that path with the design and having all this information to give to a builder is having a scope and, and, and ensuring that, say, the builders that are pricing the job have the exact same scope put into their contracts so that they're all comparing apples for apples and that if you were to get a variation that clearly was in your scope as being included, you could very much go back and say, we've both got signatures on this saying that you've got this included and this is the reason why I went with you because you were of a better price and, you know, these other builders did have this included, you know, and standing your ground about those sort of things because, um, you know, no one should be taken for a ride in this industry and I don't like hearing about it. And, um, you know, we've got to clean this industry up and with a new uh, form of rules coming through and the new builders that are coming online like myself and others, um, we're sort of trying to set that bar nice and high to get rid of any of those old school ways of thinking that you can do things off a handshake or, or do things off in a way that's just, it's just not how the, uh, the building work should be done these days. Um, now, something that I also wanted to go through was um, once you when you're doing the contract, scheduled dates of when you're going to begin and when you're going to complete is pretty important. Now, it may not be bill costs as such, but when you know you're going to be starting and you know when you're going to be finishing, you can then adjust for renting somewhere or short-term accommodation, which I said before. Um, but like you're allowed, to, you're able to budget these costs in, and I think it's really important that everyone's on the same page with that. Um, there are some really big time frames put in, but I like to be at least upfront in the fact that I put the long time frame in since my contract can be signed here, but we're starting here, and the job goes for that long. But everyone that I do sign up does get the schedule for when their job starts, and they only leave. For example, if we're doing a knockdown, they leave the week before house gets knocked down, house gets built probably the week after it's all completed for the banks and then you move in. So another point, banks, making sure the invoicing and the process on that final um, invoice is done. Now, if it's a direct transfer, the day of handover may not occur until that money is in the builder's account and the keys do not get handed over. So find out from your builder or, or for example, myself, what the procedure is on that final handover, it could be in the form of a check, a bank check, which is recognised as 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 tender, um, or it can be done as a direct transfer done on that date, and it's approved by the banks. Um, sometimes they like to do their final inspection, and they'll come through, and that can create delays. Um, we finish everything off with what we call a form six, uh, which is actually a secondary contract to the main contract. So. Um, the Form 6 is done at the end, it's called a defects notice. So once, for example, a builder has done all of his checks and balances and is happy that everything is to the standard, you'll go through and you'll do your final checks. And if there's anything that both of you guys agree on, um, it'll be written down and signed off and, and roughly how long it'll be taken until it's fixed. Um, same with if you disagree. Now, the QBC is set up as a negotiator with all this sort of stuff. So if you ever have any questions, refer to your contract or give them a call because that's what they're there for. Um, and we pay, obviously, the insurance to them. Um, so they're both helping myself as a builder, but they're also helping clients as well and, and mediating through that process. But with a Form 6, that is a contract in itself and it gets signed off by both parties, um, ensuring that we are obligated to come back and do those things. Now, that can be done prior to moving in and doing the final Form 7, which is a completion notice, or it can be done and then the completion notice be done, move in, and we are obligated to come back within the time period signed off on to get those things rectified. Um, now, for me, 
to answer the question, the biggest unexpected site costs, um, and this was a question asked by uh, Sarah, and for me personally, on a job that I was involved in, um, there was an unexpected site cost, and this was a few years back, um, which was in regards to land overflow. And um, we were able to find that in the initial stages, but it was estimated about $30,000 to fill the block to a point that we could do a slab um, type construction home. Um, and there was also going to be peers involved. Now, that was an unexpected site cost, which um, it had got through design and soil testing and it was only found when it went to a certifier. So a tip, uh, once you've gone through, say, a few of these initial things, putting it past for a desktop review from a certifier is money well spent. Uh, your builder will have a preferred certifier, which you could go past and be checked. Um, another thing that banks are doing lately is actually asking for approved plans before providing finance. Now, this may seem you'll get your pre-approval for your bank finance, then you'll have your plans and things done, um, which will get your bill contract. And then at that point, just before you're about to give it to your bank for the okay, based off your pre-approval, you'll be outlaying X amount, but then getting it to a certifier to double check everything. And then they'll tell you obviously a few things there that can then be factored in beforehand. And then that, and that final push will be then given to the certifier to give you the approved plans. Now, once he gives the approved plans, that is, that is it. That's, that's when the contract, the approved plan, and it goes into, into construction as soon as the deposit's paid. And without a variation in, in, in this underground sort of stuff happening, that's, that's going to be what the contract price is. So um, that was my unexpected costs. Um, and I mean, for the common person, I guess it can be a variety of things. It could be foundations are probably a big one. Peers, having to put peers in. Now, with peers, if you can get the compaction report from your land sales office for properties that are like cut and fill or, or, or are being filled to make it flat, if you get that information, that is like gold. So getting that from the developer with your block written on it saying this is a compaction report, when you get your soil test back and it says H1P, um, that compaction report basically cancels out that P um, and, and leaves you with a H1 slab. Now, obviously, it's awesome. That's, that's a tick, but it does then come back to the engineer and whether he's happy with the compaction report, whether he has prior knowledge of the company that has done the work there and whether he's willing to put his name against obviously the person who has done the work. So it does come back to the engineer who does design the slab. But um, other than that, I hope I've just covered a whole heap of stuff and you may end up having to re-watch this a few times to write down what I've said. But if you've got any other questions, throw them in the, uh, in the comments below. Um, I'd be really happy to try and answer some during, during the next week. Um, if not, I, if, if there's some good ones in there, I'd like to get on um, either next Wednesday or the Wednesday after. Just look out for my live updates um, and, and look out for the next one. I will, will be doing some tips and tricks on, say, maintenance work or things to look out for when you're, when you're you know, looking for land um, from a land sales office, what, what things like aspect-wise and things to look at. Um, maybe doing the comparison between um, new homes and renovating and, and finding that point, at which point do you decide to go to the new home and just knock it down? And we can have a bit more of a discussion about that. But um, give us some comments. If you, if you like what you've watched and, and, you, and you got something from it, let me know. Um, just so that, yeah, I know that next time it was worth doing and, and that someone got something out of it. All right. So everyone have a good Wednesday night. And um, sorry for the bit of a delay at the start. I was on mute and uh, didn't really realize that my mic was off. Um, but we got that sorted and I replayed the first 15 again um, and went through that. But um, next time we'll be, we'll be all good to go. All right. So catch you later. Have a good night. See ya.